somewhere, not here. He's uh, doing a, a baptism, and so I will be preaching today. And we also have a guest celebrant, Father Michael Cooley, who is a chaplain. He works under Bishop Derek Jones, who we have an entire... Let us stand and uh, worship the Lord. Almighty God, hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what the Lord Jesus Christ says, that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets.
Spirit. Almighty and everlasting God, who in the Paschal Mystery established the new covenant of reconciliation, grant that all who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives what they profess by their faith. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Join us for the reading of the first lesson. No, it's all good. All right. The first lesson is written in the third chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, beginning at the 12th verse. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people. Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses, and his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, thus he fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you like a, you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him in whatever he tells you, and it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all the prophets who have spoken, from Samuel and those who came after him, also proclaim these days. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. The word of the Lord. Be to God. Please stand for the reading of the psalm, which will be read responsively by half verse. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks unto the Lord with my whole heart. <clears throat> the works of the Lord are great. His work is worthy to be praised and held in honor. He has made his marvelous works to be had in remembrance. He has given food to those who fear him. He has shown his people the power of his works. The work of his hands are faithfulness and justice. They stand fast forever and ever. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The epistle is written in the fifth chapter of St. John's first letter, beginning at the first verse. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever 
has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? The word of the Lord. gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see his hand in the mark of his nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ.
Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Please be seated. Well, that concise and powerful call and response that we say in Eastertide celebrates and confirms our belief in the biggest miracle that ever happened in the history of the world. In our sermon today, we're going to look at miracles. Belief in miracles is at the core of our faith, so it's important to explore how we approach them. To put it bluntly, we must believe in miracles for our Christian faith to make any sense. So we'll explore our faith in miracles. We'll start by looking at the miracles that are in our readings today. We'll look at what to do when we have times of doubt. We'll study some of the unique challenges we face in keeping the faith in a time that is affluent and decadent and post-Christian. Finally, we'll explore the Christian disciplines that we can deploy to increase our faith. And, spoiler alert, one of those disciplines is our faithfulness in keeping the Lord's Day. Several of you have approached me about doing another sermon on the Lord's Day, so when we get to that, and it won't be all of the sermon, it'll be part of it, all I can say is, you asked for it. All our readings today deal with miracles, so let's start there. Psalm 111 is a psalm of praise that was penned by David for use in the church, not for any particular occasion, but for use when they were having a feast. The object of praise in this psalm is particularly on the works of the Lord. If you're feeling down or discouraged, Psalm 111 has some very good practical advice. Remember God's works. Remember his miracles. Both his works in history, and in this case, the psalm is recalling the miracles that God performed for the Israelites, and his works in your life. When you're discouraged, remember what he's done for you. Finally, Psalm 111 finishes with the phrase that is at the core of what we call wisdom literature, an important genre of literature in Scripture. The verse says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. While we don't have time today for an in-depth review of wisdom literature and the impact of this verse, it lies at the core of understanding suffering and difficulties. A fear or respect or sense of awe of God is at the very beginning of understanding. Without that, we cannot understand anything. Acts chapter 3 contains the story of a miracle and a sermon. The miracle is of the lame beggar who is healed by Peter as Peter and John are, are going up to the temple. This man laid at the gate of the temple called the Beautiful Gate, and he begged. He likely had to be carried there every day by his friends. <clears throat> Our reading today starts just after the miracle has taken place, so let's step back just a few verses to get some context. Verse 4 says, And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, 
But what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So here we have a miracle performed by Peter with John at his side. The impact of the miracle on the beggar and on the crowd, of course, was enormous. This is a big, dramatic, and amazing miracle. It's a miracle that's recorded in Scripture for us to consider 2,000 years later and forevermore. We can assume that there were many more miracles that happened that are not recorded, for Scripture tells us that, but this one is recorded. As I said, Acts chapter 3 consists of a miracle and a sermon. And our reading today picks up just as Peter is beginning to give his sermon to those who had witnessed the miracle. The thrust of Peter's sermon is that no honor or praise is due to him or John since they are simply doing the will of Christ, through the power of Christ. He asks them, why are you so surprised? This is something we should ask ourselves when we explore our relationship with miracles. Why should we be surprised? If we believe that God is who he says he is, why should miracles surprise us? Then he explains who's responsible for the miracle. Verse 13 says, The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over to and denied in in the presence of Pilate. And then we pick up again at verse 16. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man his perfect health in the presence of you all. So in a pretty rough way, Peter says to them that it's by faith in Jesus, you know, that guy that you killed, that's the man who who was responsible for making this person healthy before your very eyes. But like all good sermons, he has a happy ending. He tells them that they have a chance to repent. It's not too late. Despite the heinous acts that they committed, God is so full of love and mercy that they can still be saved if they repent. So in this case, the amazing miracle which these people witness disposes them to hear the gospel and be saved. The reading from 1 John 5 concerns what I like to call everyday miracles. Not every day in the sense that they're any less powerful or majestic or awesome than the parting of the sea or the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, but every day in the sense that we see them every day. That is, we see them if we open our eyes. If we develop the sensibility to see them, we'll see them. You know, when John writes, his phrases are packed with meaning and power. He's concise. He gets right to the heart of the matter. I'm dating myself, but when I think of his writing, I think of Sergeant Friday from Dragnet. (laughs) Just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. And today's reading is no exception. Volumes could be and have been written about a single sentence. Verse 1, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, and we love God and obey his commandments. These powerful sentences contain the very important everyday miracle that is at the core of our Christian faith. Everyone who believes that Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible, has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father is born of him. In other words, if you love the Jesus of the Bible, not the Jesus of movies or the watered-down Jesus of a phony surface religion, but the Jesus of the Bible, if you love him, If you close your eyes and you picture the Jesus of the Bible and you love him, you have been born of God. You have been set apart, quite apart from anything that you've done. In fact, nothing to do with anything you have done. If you love Jesus Christ, you have been born of God. God has given you the capacity to love him. That, my friends, is a miracle. And it is a miracle that when you open your eyes and look around you in this church, you can see every day. We have done nothing to deserve God's love. But if we love him, 
And if out of that love and sense of appreciation and thankfulness and out of a willingness to please him, we obey his commandments, then we are born of God. Does this mean we'll do a perfect job of keeping his commandments? No, I'm afraid not. But when we fail, he will forgive us and he will never, ever, ever give up on us. And if you get discouraged in that journey, let's read on to see what John tells us. Verse 3, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? And there's more good news. That faith, too, is a gift of God. When you're discouraged, remember Mark 9, 24. In the miracle of Jesus healing the boy with the unclean spirit, the father asks, you may remember, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And without uttering another word, Jesus heals the boy. Faith, my friends, even the size of a mustard seed is powerful. Faith is at the heart of our walk with Christ. If we open our eyes, we can see the miracles that are all around us in the changed lives of people who have received Christ into their lives. Those are the everyday miracles. Now, before we look at the miracles that are recorded in the gospel reading for today, I want to address the unique challenges that we face in this current age as Christians trying to keep the faith. The first thing I need to tell you is that you're weird. Now, that's a really loving thing to say on a Sunday morning, right? In fact, you're weirder than any previous generation. Let me explain. Here I'm referring to an acronym created about 15 years ago by psychologist Joseph Henrik. He said that we in the Western world are W, Western, E, educated, I, industrialized, R, rich, D, democratic. Weird. Andrew Wilson, PhD of King's College London, added two more words to the acronym, E for ex-Christian and R for romantic. And so we get the acronym weirder. We are weirder than everybody before us. Andrew Wilson has recently, recently written a book called Remaking the World, How 1776 Created the Post-Christian West. Of course, this has a double meaning in that we are also weird in the historical sense. Most people in the history of the world, and in fact still in the case in, in many parts of the world, are not any of those things. Most people aren't Western. Most people in our world do not live in the West, which is slowly dying anyways. In fact, even most Anglicans live in the global South. Most people through history have not been educated. Most were illiterate. Most people were not industrialized. Most lived by subsistence farming. Most people were not and are not rich, but poor. And most people through history have not lived in democracies. Along similar lines, an, uh, historian and author George Marsden, who has written extensively about the great Puritan pastor and thinker Jonathan Edwards, and we're going to talk about him quite a bit here in a minute, has also explored these themes in his writings and lectures. Marsden has a doctorate from Yale University and has written several biographies of Jonathan Edwards, including the magisterial Jonathan Edwards, A Life, in 2003, which was, is now considered a standard. So we'll look at Jonathan Edwards because despite living in, this, in the late 1700s, he has very good advice for us today in dealing with the fact that we're weird. What Marsden and Andrews both, both are saying in their writings is that we are also weirder in the sense that if we look back in the entire history of Christendom from the time of Christ till roughly the late 18th century, we are the weird ones. We are the ones that have a particular and peculiar and stain, strange view of life compared to all those people that came before us in Christian history. The tough thing for us is that it's sort of like the story of the fish that doesn't realize it's in water. 
we have a difficult time recognizing the errors of our own time. On a recent issue of Mars Hill Audio, I listened to a lecture by George Marsden that he gave in 2010 at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in Deerfield, Illinois. In it, he developed some ideas that get at the heart of what we're exploring here today of us being weird. He starts his lecture by contrasting two men of approximately the same age, Jonathan Edwards and Benjamin Franklin. They both were born at roughly the same time and the same place and were raised in strictly Puritan households. Marsden starts off by telling an amusing anecdote about how in the fall of 1723, these two young New Englanders are both trying to get to New York City. Benjamin Franklin had just completed his apprenticeship as a printer and he took a sloop to New York, which would have, which would have had a population of about 15,000 people back then. He gets there and the printer tells him that there is no work but he's got a son in Philadelphia if he'd like to go there. And the rest, as Mars and Quips, as they say, is history. The same month, Jonathan Edwards is at his home in Hartford, Connecticut, and was hoping to get back to New York City where he had worked as a supply pastor. He loved New York City and he had hoped to go back there. This was not to be, and eventually he became pastor of a church in Northampton in Western Massachusetts, where he succeeded his very famous grandfather, Solomon Stoddard. Most of us know Edwards, if we know him at all, mostly as a pastor and a preacher, famous for his fiery sermons, including sinners in the hands of an angry God. But the Encyclopedia Britannica says this about Edwards. Edwards was the greatest theologian of American Puritanism and perhaps the greatest America ever produced. Of course, these two men, as Marsden points out, could not possibly be any more different in temperament and commitments. To a large extent, we live in the world created by Benjamin Franklin and his like. The late 1700s was a heady time with great leaps forward in scientific discovery. It was the peak of the Enlightenment. It was a time of revolution, and the ground was shifting under everybody. It was the beginning of an ex-Christian world. At the end of his life, Edwards was the president of Princeton University. Yes, you heard that right. Back then, Ivy League schools were there for the establishment of the Protestant religion, whereas now they're there for the establishment of non-belief. Edwards died before the American Revolution, unlike Franklin, who lived to see the Constitutional Convention. The challenge for us Christians is that the innovations that took place under Franklin the invention of the library, the fire department, the various advancements that defined that era, they're very attractive. The result of the advance of science and technology, we all benefit in a material sense. We're taller, well-nourished, we're unlikely to suffer death of a child or perhaps of our entire family through disease. We live longer, we're less likely to die in agonizing pain. All of these advances are attractive, and they've been accelerated even more in recent decades with the advancement of high technology. So the result is that we live a life that is primarily secular and technical. In his lecture, Marsden gives an example, which I'll paraphrase, that really kind of captures this idea. Let's say you're in a plane and you're about to land in Chicago in a severe storm. There's very low visibility and it's a bumpy ride. You're on final approach and the captain gets on the intercom and he says, folks, I know it's stormy out there and it's very poor visibility, but I just want you to know that I'm going to follow the Lord as we go down. Yeah, that's my reaction too. You might think it's fine for him to say a prayer, but I'd much rather that he watched his instruments. This is a good example of how we live our lives. It's very easy for us to slip into the pattern where we are mostly thinking and working in a strictly secular and technical mode. And then we simply supplement that with religion where we need it. The root of the problem is that we have lost the sense of enchantment or transcendence in our lives. We've lost the sense of the closeness of God in our lives. Jonathan Edwards, even in the late 1700s, anticipates this dilemma and has a solution for us Christians. He spells out in one of his, uh, he spells this out very well in one of his sermons, a divine and supernatural light, really cool sermon, 
Uh, all of his sermons are available online. Um, I'd recommend that you read it. It's interesting. The idea is that instead of thinking of our universe as a dead thing that is just governed by mechanical rules, absent of any creator, we must think of it as an ongoing act of creation, an ongoing act of love. In other words, God's act of creation did not end at the first chapters of Genesis. God is cr constantly creating the universe at all times, and that is an act of love and an act of beauty. He develops the idea of, that the triune God had no need to make man or the world, but that because of an overflowing love among the Trinity, God created man to love him and to be in relationship. So as we go through our life, don't think of the world as a dead thing governed by mechanical forces. Our lives should not be viewed as mechanistic, humanistic, governed by business and consumption with a little bit of religion thrown on top for good measure. Instead, with God's help, we can develop a sensibility that sees our entire lives, our relationships, our commitments, our world, nature, beauty, as an ongoing act of loving creation by God, a world that is enchanted and beautiful, a world that is buzzing with God's active creation and love. Jonathan Edwards gives us some very good principles to combat the problem of keeping our faith in miracles in the face of an ex-Christian world. And we'll finish up by looking at how our gospel reading for today can give us some practical tools for strengthening our faith as well. The gospel reading involves the biggest miracle of all, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Believing in Christ's resurrection is at the heart of our faith. But there's another important aspect to our gospel reading today that you may have missed. It is the establishment as the Lord's day as the Christian Sabbath. The story starts on what day of the week? the first day of the week. That would be Sunday. And what are they doing? They are gathered together. And what happens? Christ appears in a room that he physically could not have appeared in because the doors were locked and bolted. Christ is confirming for the New Testament church that on the first day of the week, they are to gather together and Christ will be with them. Then we have the story of Thomas not believing that Christ appears. And when does he reappear? Take a guess. The following Sunday. It's a bit confusing because instead of saying a week later, that would have been really straightforward, the scripture says eight days later, but that's counting the, the day that they were in. Regardless, it is Sunday and Christ is appearing with them once again with the doors locked and bolted in his resurrected body. They are gathered together in assembly and Christ is with them. You getting the picture? That's what we're supposed to do on Sundays. So here we have in Scripture the establishment of the Lord's Day as the Christian Sabbath. Now there is no question of the importance of the Sabbath throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. In fact, even before Abraham, even before the establishment of Israel as the nation favored by God, the Sabbath was already there because of how the world was created, because God rested on the seventh day. And it's not as if we can pick and choose which commandments we want to obey. There are some that argue that since we're not under the Mosaic law, we don't have to follow the commandment to keep the Sabbath. But this simply does not hold up in Scripture. Once again, we are the weirdos here. Throughout most of the history of Christianity and the Western world, this was not even a topic of discussion. Really, until, what, the 1940s or 50s, probably it wasn't a topic of discussion. Keeping the Lord's Day has always been central to the faith. As I've discussed with many of you, in the Lamb family, we were not really convicted of the ideas around the Sabbath until about seven or eight years ago. And folks, it's not as if we need to look beyond the Ten Commandments to find validation for things that we're supposed to do, but I will give, throw a couple more in. Uh, and that is that it's been a beautiful and life-changing experience uh, to be obedient in this area of our lives. So quickly, what has this meant for us? And before we get into the specifics, I recognize that for those who do shift work and are pilots, and you know, I understand that there are, there are situations where you might need, need to make another day of the week your Sabbath. But in the Lamb household, we don't work. My work here is clergy. I do not consider work because I'm serving the Lord. 
I do nothing related to my commercial responsibilities. We do not conduct any commerce of any kind. We don't shop even online. We try not to use money, so we avoid having to even go to the gas station. So if you see us out there on the side of the road, you know, give us a ride home. If we have meals together in fellowship, it's not in a restaurant. We would do it around our table or around guest tables. Now I'm speaking mostly of what we don't do, which sounds sort of negative. Let me say a little bit about what we do do. We have a glorious day of rest and service. We nap. We read. We go for a walk. We spend time with family. We eat. We feast. We enjoy good food and good wine, maybe even at lunch. I'm happy to talk about anyone or to anyone about the particulars of what we do, but that's the thrust of it. We consider it a tithe of our time. That's a good way to think about it. It's the first day of the week, so start the week in the Lord's presence and thinking about God uh, and being with family and serving him. All of this helps us to avoid falling into the frame of mind that I re re referred to earlier. It, help us, it helps us to keep our faith if we have a rule of faith, like keeping the Sabbath. To keep the faith in the ex-Christian ex world is difficult. It's even harder when you're weird like we are. But with God's help and with prayer, disciplines, and keeping the Sabbath, it can be easier. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We stand as we confess our faith in the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. He trusted for our salvation. He came down from heaven and was incarnate in the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the world, saying, Hear our prayer. For the peace of the whole world and for the well-being and unity of the people of God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For Archbishop Foley Beach, Bishop Frank Lyons, Father Joey, Father Cass, Father Michael Cooley, Deacon Jeff, and for all the clergy and people of our diocese and congregation. Lord, in your mercy, Today we pray for the Church of the Resurrection in Clarksville, Tennessee, asking you, Lord, to bless and strengthen their ministry and fellowship to be good witnesses for Jesus Christ. For all who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith, we remember especially the Anglican Church of the Congo, the Anglican Church of Nigeria, the churches in India, China, Myanmar, and Ukraine. Lord, in your mercy, for our nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service, especially the President of the United States, Joe, and the Governor of Georgia, Brian. Lord, in your mercy, 
For all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any adver other adversity, especially those suffering from short-term illness, those suffering from long-term illness, those with special needs, and those deployed. Lord, in your mercy, for the College of Bishops and the Anglican Church of North America as they prepare to elect a new archbishop this June, give them wisdom, discernment, and unity. Lord, in your mercy, for all those who have departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection, In thanksgiving, let us pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You may add additional petitions and thanksgiving. We lift up the country of Ukraine, the country of Israel, and ask for your mercy there and destroy the peace. We pray for uh, Father Cass for strength and healing and also for Audrey as she uh, faces surgery coming up that you would guide the physicians and bring her healing. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. <clears throat> Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. We stand and exchange the peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And with your spirit. Well, good morning again, everybody. I don't have much to add for announcements. In fact, I can't find them in the bulletin. I'm looking at the right spots. We don't have any, so that's pretty straightforward. Uh, anything you think we need to know, Deborah or Pam? I know they had a blast doing the bowling, and a uh, few people walking with some sore arms today, probably. <laughs> All right. 
I'll hand it back over to our good celebrant. Well, I ask, Lord, have mercy on us this morning, um, because um, this is this is not made of stainless steel and it doesn't have wheels. And this is what I'm accustomed to going my own as a hospital chaplain. I'm not even actually a hospital chaplain. I'm a trauma and ED chaplain. And so um, I, I've only done the Eucharist a few dozen times. I've done last rites over 300. I stopped counting and um, baptized a, several dozens of people, but did last rites within a few hours of that. But anyway, so this is... Um, this is new to me to have uh, a, a deacon. I was I was ordained in um, lace-up tack boots and uh, cargo pants, so I will do my first Eucharist in a church in the same way. And um, I'm glad someone has wingtips on. And uh, anyway, so it, it is it is good to be here, and thank you for this opportunity. O Lord, is the greatness, and the power, and the glory, and the victory, and the majesty. For everything in heaven on earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. All things come from you, O Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. But chiefly, we are bound to praise you for this glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. 
For he is the true Paschal Lamb who was offered for us and has taken away the sin of the world, who by his death has destroyed death and by his rising to life again has won for us everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had sinned against you and become subject to evil and death, you, in your mercy, sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all, that by his suffering and death we might be saved. By his resurrection, he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory, that we might become we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of the faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, our Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, and we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him that he may dwell in us and we in him. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us with all your saints into the joy of your heavenly kingdom where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him, through him, and with him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. I will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Christ, our Passover feast, is sacrificed for us. 
Therefore, let us keep the feast. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose character is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body and our souls washed through his most precious blood that we may dwell in him and he in us. Amen.
For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are the living bodies of Christ's Son, the heirs of the eternal kingdom. Now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and to serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. The peace of God, who brought it again through from the dead, our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God, the Father Almighty, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Please stand.
Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.